The world of Matose Hino Slave is one of give and take. On the one hand, Japan greatly benefits from the resources from the Mato dimension. On the other, monsters called Shuki are constantly invading the real world and trying to kill people. The 10 squads of the Mato Defense Corps exist to suppress these monsters and mitigate the damage they cause. Each squad is led by a different woman as women are the only people who can receive powers from the special peaches obtained in Mato. Our protagonist, Yuki, is only involved because of his affinity with the captain of the 7 squad's power to pull the full potential of those she touches out, transforming him into a fighting monster, all in exchange for rewards that aren't safe for YouTube and making him pretty much the only man in the army. Because. However, lately their job has been made much more difficult by the discovery of the existence of the 8 Thunder Gods, mysterious beings that want to destroy humanity. After an adventure where it discovered that Yuki's sister and select women were transformed into monstrous beings by the peaches they ate, the Thunder Gods arrived to kidnap two of said women, feeding them to an egg that would develop into a new Thunder God, leading to the birth of Kusetsu, a monster that grows more powerful by absorbing more beings into herself. Born with the personality and abilities of the women she had consumed, Kusetsu sets out to the human world to find more women to consume and satiate her hunger for more power. And it was this decision that led to her drawing the attention of two notable captains of the Mato Corps, Kyoka Uzen, the chief of the Seventh Squad and the female main character, and Mira Kamiyuten, the chief of the second unit and one of my personal favorite characters in the story. Mira sets a striking image, with the spiked hair and traditional style of the captain uniform substituted for an open jacket and wrapped chest. She perfectly strikes the image of a delinquent girl. She might also just be Kyoka's biggest rival for the seat of the commander of the defense corps, having been served her first loss as a gang leader by a female MC before they reach their current positions as captains. However, that gruff exterior and confident demeanor simply hide her true nature. Mira is compassionate and honest, with a strong sense of justice and a disdain for the monsters that attack innocent people. And her observational skills are not one to scoff at, having already figured out that something was going on between Kyoka and their fellow captain Tenka, but being willing to wait for when the time was right to be told the truth, because she trusts her rival. And of course, probably the most shocking twist in the entire arc, her completely logical and reasonable reaction to an accidental pervert gag, completely lacking in violence and even insisting that Yuki continues to stay in their room to avoid difficulty in case there's an emergency attack, even through her obvious embarrassment. For a second, I thought I'd accidentally switched over to reading something not made in Japan. But then we get to the real fun stuff as the operation to rescue the captured women is finally underway. Once the police track down the hideout the Thunder God has hidden the women in, we get to see a taste of the true power of the captain of the second unit. When the two soldiers and one custodian show up, they are immediately confronted by a massive monster guarding the building. Mira confidently walks up to it, dodges a few blows, and then lays it out with a punch so powerful, Yuki is struck by amazement and wonders if her ability is to make herself stronger. However, before she can finish that job, a different monstrous Shuki, Akura, threatens the life of a hostage, forcing her to stop fighting and get stabbed in the chest. But before the reader has time to contemplate that, her body dissolves and a second mirror drops from the sky, shattering the Shuki's arm with a savage kick and rescuing the hostage. As Kyoka easily dispatches the first guard, we get more insight into the kind of woman Mira is. A woman so inspiring that her vice captain's ability manifested as a rare type that only affects one person. Specifically, when Megumi Zaha holds up her flag, Mira's strength is amplified to the point of being able to kill Shuki with her bare hands. Which, frankly, is just an unfair addition when you consider her true ability. Because while the captains fight off the guards, the hostages in the mansion are all rescued by an army of mirrors. But before Akura can truly contemplate this, he finds himself surrounded by dozens of mirrors who all immediately descend upon him. Honestly, an enviable position if they weren't all beating the shit out of him. And the completely disconnected yet badass name of Mira's ability? All killing. The ability to create clones of herself without losing any strength. Why is it called that? I don't know, maybe there's something special about the name in Japanese, but still, all killing. Now that's a cool name. But before we get to the true showcase of Mira's ability, 
We get a brief respite after the rescue is done and the characters get to talk and then Mira accidentally walks in on Yuki getting rewarded for being such a good slave. Her freak out is as hilarious as you can imagine. However, this short break is short lived as Kusetsu shows up in Yuki's room, paralyzing him before he can react. She is angry about all her work going to waste, but she's also curious. Yuki is considered special by her fellow thunder god Shikoku, so she decided that she's gonna take him instead. But first, she wants to experiment. While she was collecting women, she walked in on one of them, engaging in less than family friendly activities. So she wants to know what the big deal is. But before this manga can get, well about as racy as it normally is honestly, Yuki manages to call for Mira and the fight begins. I hand over this victory to- <laughs> Kusetsu makes the choice to leave the battle and faces out of the room. Mira sees this and decides that a wall is simply not enough of an obstacle to keep her from getting the first blow on her opponent, kicking her out into the open. Enraged, the thunder god throws her off and goes in for a kick, an attack met with equal force. The captain then activates her ability, summoning a group of clones. Clones that are quickly dispatched by Kusetsu's beautiful attack, leaving Mira to go in for the kill. But before she can land her attack, She's then cut apart, only for the original to show up behind her and punch the supposed god. However, Kusetsu had already activated one of her stolen abilities, making the punch slip right across her slippery face. Now enraged by this woman who has the audacity to strike a god, Kusetsu decides that the only reasonable choice is to release most of the shuki she has sealed in cards throughout the city in order to distract her opponent. These cards were given to her by Shigoku to make sure that she stayed safe as the plan was for her to retreat if she was in danger. A truly untenable situation, but not one Mira can't handle. Focusing her cloning ability on numbers over strength, she unleashes a horde of herself to rescue all the civilians, assisted by Kyoka for the particularly strong beast her clones can't handle. We then get more information and figure out exactly how Mira developed this power as she's always believed that simply having one body was not enough for her to protect everyone she leads and so she manifested the ability all killing. Seriously what is with that name? As Kusetsu makes the leave though, Mira laughs at the idea of a god running away from a fight, going so far as to call her ugly which after all the times Kusetsu has gone out of her way to describe herself as beautiful makes sense as an insult to bait her to stay in the fight. Because obviously, can you imagine unironically calling either of these women ugly? Mira is determined to not let the monster escape, even if she's exhausted her clones. Leaping over her opponent, she feigns a punch that won't work before delivering a savage kick. She even reacts fast enough to catch two feather blades aimed at her back, flying for her blind spot. Though this is enough of a distraction for her opponent to throw her off, threatening to attack her from above as she falls. But the captain won't be killed so easily. Squeezing out even more of her strength, she creates yet another clone and uses herself as a platform, launching forward and shoulder checking the god, boldly declaring that she is going down. Recalling Shikoku's warning about humanity's ability to bring out unexpected strength, Kusetsu decides that it's time to get serious and powers up, stopping Mira's attempt to slam her face into the ground and throwing her off, now ready to deliver Mira's deserved divine punishment. By now, the clones are all returning to the fight, though as they were created with a focus on numbers, they can't really last long against the enraged god. However, they do allow Mira to get close, delivering a flurry of blows too fast for her opponent to make herself slippery to avoid. But it's no matter as Kusetsu simply eats her punch like it's a beautiful woman and sends her flying. Now sure that the one that didn't break apart is the real Mira, Kusetsu dodges yet another Mira clone, uninterested in them and goes in for the final blow and is shocked as the mirror she hit dissolves before her. Another clone. The first one she had avoided had been a distraction so Mira could squeeze out even more strength and substitute herself with another double. The mirror she dodged and the original both come in, delivering a savage blow on either side of her, crushing her heart between their fists. She said she wanted to experiment and she just got pounded in on both sides. Kusetsu, initially frozen from the impact, smacks the captain aside, commenting that with more clones, she could have killed her. But she spent too much of her power saving the whole city. So she asks if she's ready to pay the price for saving all those people. 
But Mira is unperturbed. All she's ready for is to save everyone and defeat the god. At no point in this fight has she considered that she could only do one. Kusetsu is initially shocked by her opponent's resolve before smiling and properly introducing herself as Kusetsu of the 8th Thunder Gods. Mira responds with her own name, Mira Kamiyuten, chief of the anti-demon Corps second unit, though she does leave out her other title, unapologetic badass. The fight between the exhausted chief and the impressed deity moves into its crescendo, the two women going in for the final blow. With all the Shuki in the city defeated, Yuki and Kyoka make their way to the battle to help in the fight, arriving just in time to witness the worst possible outcome, the sight of Kusetsu absorbing the captain. Mira Kamiyuten fought with all of her might. She could have won the battle with her ability, but it was an ability best suited for helping as many people as possible. The only reason she was so strong in the first place was because of that personality that allowed her vice captain to essentially become a power boost for her. And even with most of her strength dedicated to saving everyone, her resolve didn't falter and she still came close enough to victory to turn the gods anger at her attacks into respect for her strength and beauty. Mira pulled out all the stops to defeat a god and make sure no one died, saving everyone and outsmarting her opponent. An admirable attempt, even if she fell just short of total victory, leaving the rest of the battle to the main characters. But that's a story for another day. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, don't hesitate to hit the like button and subscribe for more content. And thank you to No Operator for inspiring this video. I might make another one like it. Until then, thank you and good day.